Hi, I'm Tara G, your host of Frankly Speaking with Tara G. Welcome again to our global gathering of phenomenal women and those of you who love them. Yes, you, mothers, daughters, grand and great-grandmothers, fearsome and generous, humble and honest, in pursuit of new possibilities. You know, here we dig deep and we come up strong. For those of you listening for the first time, each month we explore a new theme inspired by you. Yes, I said you. We bravely walk into places where tradition has taught us there are some things we just don't talk about, but not at this table. And no matter how hard judgment knocks, it will not be able to come in. Beloved, here we're going to start right where we are. Every week we experience, educate, encourage, and empower each other. We share aha moments and stories that have been left in our pockets for too long. Every week we start right where we are. I am so excited about the show. Y'all know September's our birthday month. Yeah, one year we've been doing this. You know, I couldn't have done it without you, right? Those of you who encouraged and inspired, and on the days I felt like, I can't do this. I'm tired of being tired. You said, girl, you better get up. This is what you're supposed to do. Thank you for that. Thank you for your help. You're listening to Radio Fairfax in Fairfax, Virginia, on your TV, computer, or mobile device. And we are webcast worldwide on Saturday evening at 8 p.m. And I know date night is important, so it's okay. It's okay. You go out and have a good time. And you can catch us on our podcast on YouTube. Just key in, frankly speaking, with Tyra G. And the other ones of you that write me these wonderful notes want to connect offline, you know I love it, right? It is Tyra at TyraGarlington.com. And I want to thank Mr. Courtney Nero for composing and performing our theme song and for using his imagination and naming it, I'm Listening. This September, our theme is Bold and Untold. We continue to discover who's seated around our virtual global table through their stories. We're not only going to hear their stories, but we're going to look and listen behind their words. Oh boy, today have we got a show for you. I could call it Out of This World. I am talking literally. We are going to spend some time in space. Of course, you're going to have to use your imagination, right? You have to visualize much of what you will hear. To create our common thought space for today, let me ask you a question. What comes to mind when you think dancing with stars? And no, I'm not talking about a TV show, okay? I'm talking about imagining, imagining those things we can't reach or we can't touch. Maybe you walk into a science fiction space when you think of the stars, or maybe you're like me, who like to sit and watch on a clear, sacred night, way above me, twinkling stars, some even winking at me. Have you ever seen a shooting star? Have you ever wondered, where does it come from? Where is it going? How about an eclipse of the moon? You know, I don't have answers but I have a guest who does. And when I think of, I was preparing for the show, I wanted to make sure I had some intelligent questions to ask. I looked at NASA's website. Now, let me tell you what I did. I Googled N-A-S-A, and I got 284 million hits in .52 seconds. Does that tell you the prominence and the importance? Now, for our international audience, I'm referring to the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. That was started as a part of the U.S. government in 1958. And what they do is they oversee science and technology that has to do with airplanes and space. Well, the first headline that intrigued me was one that said, What's next for NASA?
It began with NASA's vision, and I quote, we reach for new heights and reveal unknown, the unknown, for the benefit of humankind. Hey guys, that's us, humankind, right? It says thousands of people have been working around the world and off of it for decades trying to answer some basic questions. Who's out there? How do we get there? What will we find? What can we learn there? Or learn by just trying to get there. What, what, what is out there that will make life easier for us on Earth? NASA is great at keeping the public informed. I discovered this. NASA TV has shows about the space station. NASA blogs and social media, they have downloaded apps that you can enjoy. But here's what I love the most. Would you believe they have a gallery? And let me tell you what, it speaks amazing. It's a photo gallery. If you want to feed your imagination, check out NASA's website and click on galleries. It's amazing. It is totally amazing. You may get stuck there for a while, but don't let me digress. Some of the headlines I picked up, and these are 2017 headlines. I'm just going to give you a few. Check this out. The past 12 months have also been full of awesome discoveries about alien planets orbiting distant stars, including the detection of seven Earth-sized planets around a single sun. I, I can't even get my head around that. Planets orbiting distant stars. What are stars anyway? Here's another one. And while scientists had to say farewell to the Cassini spare fact, uh, excuse me, spacecraft, they also said hello to what might be an interstellar visitor to our solar system. Now that should have piqued some imaginations. An interstellar visitor to our solar system. Ready for that? In early January, scientists announced the discovery of not one, not two, not six, but seven Earth-sized planets orbiting the star Trappist-1. Amazing, right? Now, all of you were awake on, maybe not, on August 21 for the first time in nearly 100 years. A total solar eclipse crossed the United States from coast to coast along a very narrow path stretching from Oregon to South Carolina. Now, the weather was such that a lot of us did not have the opportunity to see that, but people watched as the moon, some people watched as the moon blocked out the disk of the sun, transforming night into day and revealing hidden layers of the sun's atmosphere, even though it was just for a few moments. After our break, we're going to meet a phenomenal woman who is brilliant and passionate and fun and is also a science and communication mess messenger for NASA. I want you to put your feet up, maybe grab a snack, but stay close. And we are back. It is time, it is time, it is time for you to meet Ms. No, 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 no. This child has worked hard for this. <laughs> Dr. <laughs> Michelle <laughs> Fowler. Yes, although I mean, the, the Ms. Michelle is fine. Are you, oh, the, no. The, 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 the doctor sounds kind of formal, doesn't it? <laughs> it's, well, you know what it speaks of is achievement. Mm. And uh, I like to celebrate that. But here's the thing, Michelle is an American astronomer and research scientist. You've heard the term astrophysicist, right? Well, she's all wrapped up in that, but here's the thing. <laughs> I'm gonna let Michelle tell you a little bit about herself. I've discovered that my guests, when they speak their words and voices are heard, people can get a mental picture, an image, so that through the rest of the show, they kind of conjure up what Michelle must be like. Michelle, please tell us. Well, that's awfully kind of you. I was just listening to your introduction. I was thinking, you know, that, that's the best introduction to NASA I've ever heard. We, we, we don't have anything at NASA that's as good as you. <laughs> so that was lovely. I was oh, sitting back. Thank you. Oh, and, and just you, your, the empowerment and, you know, and the idea that we're having this this wonderful zone that's for us and it's free of judgment. Yes. I, I mean, yes. I, I, just, I just need to have you in my life, I think. You know, okay, we're here. <laughs> you and me. Okay. Yes. I know, I know that um, I've studied 
I did this. I, I did. I studied Michelle. I actually heard her speak at another event, and I was so impressed. And I was impressed with the passion and the energy and how she made difficult concepts sound like something we hear every day. And I said, I've got to have this woman on my show. And she said, yes. She said, yes. So, Michelle, I don't, I don't know where you want to start, but I... I like some of the words uh, that you've exchanged with me, knowing who we are, having what we need in the beginning, using that. You can start wherever. You can start with space camp. Ah, yes. Well, so, I mean, as you said, so I'm, that's my job. I'm an astronomer. I'm an astrophysicist. And um, I guess, you know, in a way, it doesn't sound right to call it my job because I, I think people who love space that much it, it's sort of your life I yes, mean, it, yes. It, it, there isn't a place where the job starts and the rest of my life stops I mean it, it's all kind of in, in one but um, as you were saying it's, I, I went to space camp in, in Huntsville Alabama I think uh, the first time was when I was 13 years old and then, and then once again when I was 14 mm-hmm. and uh, this was uh, this is probably the first time that I really found my tribe so to speak I that hear there, you there I were know other, what that is. other kids <laughs> my age that uh, that liked uh, NASA and space as much as I did and the, you know, the interesting thing, and, and uh, this is one of the big, uh, I think, takeaways from my life, is that I, I, I just always liked the sky, and I couldn't really tell you why. My, my mom said that as soon as I could walk, uh-huh. she would find me sort of sneaking out to look at the stars at night. And, and my parents weren't scientists, and they, they, they'd certainly, you know, they were all very intimidated by math, and oh, it sounds very hard, and you know, why would you want to do that? But they, uh, they, they, they told me that it was just something that I had from the very beginning. Fascinated and with something above it. you couldn't touch. That's right. I mean, and twinkling. And <laughs> yes. Well, you you were saying this that you know you, you see the stars and they seem very small and distant yeah, and like yeah, you yeah. said twinkling in the sky. But then that quote that you read, where we have found in one case seven Earth-sized planets that are around a single star. What you discover is that the stars are the same thing as the sun. Keep they're, talking. They're, they're, they're just <laughs> they're just like the sun, but they're farther away. So these these tiny little lights in the sky turn out to be the biggest fires in the universe. Oh, my goodness. You know, the sun is so big you could fit a million Earths inside it. Yes. And it's this giant ball of burning hydrogen gas. And so the stars are just like that. It's just that they're farther away. And so all of a sudden, it leads you deeper and deeper. You know, tell me more. Right. So, so the stars are like the sun. Do they have planets around them? Are there other people up there? Is there life up there? Right. And before you know it, your imagination is taking you very far away indeed. And, you know, one of the things I know uh, I picked up, and it was a new concept for me, the term light years is yes. not about time. It's about distance. And so when you talk about, um, well, one of, the, one of the things you talk about is dancing with stars. <laughs> Tell us what that meant to you or what it means to you. It's probably constant. Well, I do have to do a, sh- a shout out to Donald Driver because I mean, when, when I think about Dancing with the Stars, I'm a Green Bay Packer fan, and he oh. won <laughs> Dancing with the Stars that one year. We, we had to watch every single episode to, you know, to cheer on Donald Driver. But um, I've always loved to dance. I love to move. Mm-hmm. I think uh, one of the hardest things for me as a kid was having to sit still through a whole you know class period. Yes, and and I, I I liked school and I enjoyed learning and all that. But boy, I, I mean I I think a lot of my imagination was sort of trying to deal with the fact that I was going to have to sit still for the next say seven hours. Yes, and 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 school was not very stimulating. It was a little bit on the boring side. Like I said, I did enjoy learning, so I just found other places to go. In, my in your mind, in That's your imagination. Right. And so I, I still dance. I, I've studied, uh, I think you were saying that you found uh, there was a NOVA program called The Secret yes. Lives of Scientists. Yes, yes. And it has me in a Renaissance costume. Dancing. Dancing. That's right. So I, I've studied Renaissance dance. So this, this, these are dances from like the, the late 1500s, the, the court of Henry VIII. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. His daughter, you were in Elizabeth. costume. Yes, I was in a full costume. Yeah, that, that costume was made uh, uh, partially by me and also a friend of mine who's a costumer made sort of the larger... You know, I'm not very good at sewing, so he sort of made the larger dress. Uh-huh. But I, I did the embroidery. I made the hat. I made the ruff. You know, the, the big, ruffles the big around collar. The, That's oh right. My. So I had, I had to do a, a lot of that. Um, my husband and I performed at the Los Angeles Renaissance Fair for years with this group. And uh, we performed at local museums, at local schools. And so we actually studied the original documented dances that they really did at yes. the time of Henry VIII and Elizabeth I. And so that was lovely. But... I mean, you can also find me contra dancing, which is it's sort of an English country dance that our square dancing came out of. Mm-hmm. Um, I love, uh, I, I mean, I love ballroom dancing. I was taking tango lessons recently. I love swing dancing. 
um, I, I love band dancing. You'll just you'll find me <laughs> just, just, just around my house, just kind of moving around. So yeah, yeah I yeah. mean, I, everything in the universe moves. N- nothing is still. That's one of the things that you learn, that the whole idea of how fast is something going, that question loses meaning because you need to first ask in relation to what. I mean, you know, for example, the Earth is actually flying around the sun mm-hmm. at, at 60,000 miles an hour. Right now, right now, you and I are traveling at sixty thousand miles an hour. I'm dizzy. J- I know, just in our orbit around the sun. Yeah. But the sun is moving around the galaxy. So, so we live in a large family of stars called the Milky Way galaxy. You've probably mm-hmm. heard of that term. And this is a family of about five hundred billion stars, and we are all turning around a common center. But we're going at half a million miles an hour around wow. the center of the Milky Way. So. Everything is dancing. Everything is moving. I mean, you've probably heard of astronomy referred to as like a celestial dance. Yes. And I also heard you say that dancing is like math. That's right. Did I misquote you? No, absolutely. Uh, So especially when you do dances like the Renaissance dances, they're very much patterns. Okay. There there, there may be groups of five or even more people Mm -hmm. moving together in this wonderful mathematical pattern. And the different verses of the song become slight variations on that pattern. And to me, um, you know, mathematics is so often taught as something kind of dry and, 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 and you know, kind of boring, doesn't have much, you know, movement to it. But in fact, you're solving mathematical problems as you, as you dance these dances. And you can, you can dance a lot of math, too, I think. <laughs> Do you know, it's interesting, for the first time, I had a revelation as you talked. Because I can, I love to dance. Yes. I can sit and watch someone and learn a dance, but I'm counting. Yes. I am counting and I'm watching. And if there's someone on the dance floor and I want to learn that dance that I don't know, I, in my mind, I have a mathematical schematic. And I know I'm going here, four, here, two, you know, and I, I never hook that up. I never. Everything in astronomy is a lot easier if you move with it. Like when I would try to teach, uh, like I would work with teachers and students. I'd, you know, what, what, how do the phases of the moon work? You know, okay. What, I mean, why okay. do you? Why does the moon change shapes in the sky? If you actually just get a light, you know, and, and and you get some balls and you start to move them around and you start to see how light is projected on the moon from the sun and what the angle of the Earth would be, all of a sudden the phases of the moon are easy. They make perfect sense. It's not something you need to memorize. It's something that if you just move through, Mm -hmm. all of a sudden it just falls into place. So I think astronomy is very much about movement. And it it was a good fit for a little kid that didn't like to sit still. (laughs) You know, I think you were probably bored waiting for the other students to catch up. Well, I I think all students learn at their own pace. Yeah, they do. I mean, there, there were certainly things that other students caught on to much faster than I did. Uh, you know, for example, I was really not very good at any sort of sports. I remember that. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I loved science. I loved history. I loved art. I think uh, for me, uh, you know, the, the, the perfect education would have been you just set me loose in a museum, and there, uh, there are adults to answer questions, and I just go educate myself. I loved it. I couldn't wait to learn as much as I could. So you're right. I mean, sort of having to do it at everyone else's pace, pace. Was, it was a bit frustrating. And, and like you said, we have multiple intelligences. Oh, absolutely. And what saddens me a lot is that our educational system has difficulty uh, addressing all of those within one classroom. Yes. And what I've also learned is, well, being a teacher and a principal at one point, is teachers teach from their own learning style. Mm -hmm. And so if you have another child in the class that is not learning the same way you are, then you have someone that needs to go to an imaginary (laughs) place. Well, absolutely. I mean, think about, you know, teachers will often teach math as something you're sort of taking a pencil and you're writing down a piece of paper. But you can also teach math, like we said, as a dance or as a movement. Absolutely. Geography. Geometry, I'm sorry. You know, know, use it visually. You know, some Mm -hmm. people learn, you know, auditory through listening. Some some, some have to shape it with their hands. Some Some have to move through it. You know, it's it, and also just the you know the different sorts of emotional intelligence as well. That's something absolutely that become very aware of in life. You know, I mean, you can be a brilliant astronomer, but not be able to to tell what people's feelings are and how they're working and how to get them to work together. You know, watching people uh, be good leaders, watching them manage other people. I've, I've started to have a huge amount of respect for emotional intelligence. Uh, yes, and I, I've had several of those tests, and I, I said, well, no, you couldn't score that high because you can't <laughs> do A, B, C, and D, you know. But anyway, I wanted to um, move to something that I am curious about. Yes. And that is Mission Juno. 
Oh, right. Yes. One of my favorites. Okay. But, well, I mean, they're all my favorites. It's kind of like choosing between your children. I mean, I mean, I just, I pick some <laughs> things as I listen. I say, yeah. oh, I want to know about that. I want to know. I about love that. So, I mean, that's exactly how you do science. Go, go where your curiosity takes yeah. you. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, right now at NASA, we actually operate about 108 different science missions. And Juno, of course, is our current mission out around the biggest planet in the right. solar system, Jupiter. Right. Right. And, and it is returning unbelievably beautiful images. Did, did you see some of those images? I did. It's like a work of art. Isn't I know. It? And that's what I want people to understand when oh. I want them to go look at the images. Yes. It's amazing. So what are your questions about Juno? I, I just want to know. I want you to tell the audience why, how, <laughs> how, you know, what are we doing? Why are we doing it? Oh, so many reasons. So, so Jupiter is a giant planet. It, it, yes. It's so big you could fit a thousand Earths inside it. And, and unlike our planet, there's nowhere to really stand on Jupiter. Jupiter doesn't have a surface. Really? They, uh, no. I mean, they, they call it a gas giant, although that's a little bit misleading. Um, it, it's basically made of the same sort of stuff the sun is made of. It's, it's almost all hydrogen, a little bit of helium, okay. and a little bit of everything else that's the same as our sun. It's, it's a big ball of gas, but in the center, it gets very dense and very hot. The, in the center of Jupiter, it's actually hotter than the surface of the sun, hotter than 10,000 degrees. And it's basically really hot, dense hydrogen liquid in the center. So it's not all gas. Some okay. people say, could you, could, you, could you shoot something straight through Jupiter? They, they think of it as a cloud. They call okay. it a gas giant. Okay. It gets very hot and very dense in the center. But it's, it's really all made of hydrogen. It's a very different kind of planet from our planet. Like I said, there's nowhere solid. There, there may be a very small solid thing inside it somewhere. But honestly, with the, with the Juno mission, that's being called into question. It yeah. may just be sort of denser liquid at the middle. But um, you know, Jupiter is amazing for a number of reasons. I mean, it, it, is, it is by far the most massive and largest planet in the solar system. And in fact, you could physically fit all the other planets inside it <laughs> together. Oh, wow. And, um, and you know the uh, the amazing thing is that that it, it when it formed it probably sucked up most of the material in the solar system that planets formed out of you know, billions of years ago about five billion years ago the uh, the planets were forming out of a giant cloud of gas and dust that was it gas. yeah just gas and dust that that's all that we were we see this happening all around us with the Hubble Space Telescope we can take pictures of other stars that are forming solar systems right now. And we can actually watch the planets as they form. So this is not actually all that much of a mystery. We see it happening all around us in space. And so we know it happened to us about 5 billion years ago. But Jupiter has in it the whole story of the solar system. It, it sucked up most of the material of the cloud that we formed out of. So we're asking a lot of questions about you know, how much water was there, you know, how much of the other elements were there, um, how much hydrogen is in Jupiter can actually tell us even what things were like just after the beginning of the universe, after the Big Bang. But Jupiter also is an amazing story. I mean, it's a fascinating place just by itself. It's beautiful. It's huge. It's our biggest planet in our solar system. But then there are all these other stories. Like, we now think there's a lot of evidence that Jupiter moved around in the solar system. And when it did, it knocked planets silly. I mean, it was like a pinball game. So billions of years ago, we, we have more evidence now than ever that Jupiter actually was not where it was now. It came in closer to Earth, knocked all sorts of planets around. If you look at the surface of the moon at night in the sky, mm -hmm. you see there's all kinds of craters and yes, dark yes, areas. Yes. Uh -huh. we, we think that a lot of that, a lot of that material that hit the moon, and it hit us too, hit the Earth, uh, happened when Jupiter moved into our area of the solar system and brought all kinds of asteroids and comets and rocks with it. So... I mean, Jupiter is a fascinating place. Jupiter has, at the moment, 79 known moons. We discovered 12 new moons two weeks ago. <laughs> well, okay, so so to me, it sounds it sounds like science fiction. It does, but that's all the real stuff. I know, and so what I'm wondering, okay, what do we hope to use the information for that we're gaining from Jupiter? It, it always goes back to where did we come from? You know, okay. I mean, the questions, I mean, I think you asked about the shooting star. You know, yes, where, I did. Where, where does it come from? Where is it going? So the reason we study the other planets is we want to understand how our solar system formed. And we look at other solar systems forming and try to piece together our own story. And in the case of Jupiter as well, we're also look, hoping to answer the question, is there life out there? Because Jupiter has, uh, in particular, one moon called Europa. And there are others as well. But Europa is a, a moon of Jupiter that has a liquid water ocean. And it's protected by a, a shell of ice, but the ice is cracking. And we actually think there's evidence of the water flying out of the ice, fighting out of the cracks. 
And so Europa actually has a saltwater, warm, liquid ocean that's rich in organic molecules. And this is one of the places that we really want to go. We really want to land there because we think it's a possible environment for life. Okay. All right. So, all right. Let me, let me just calm down and get it together. <laughs> all right. So what we're learning from Jupiter is what we're seeing currently is telling us a lot about history. That's right. Okay. So we are understanding that it moves. Mm -hmm. We understand that it might have bumped some other um, planets out of the way on its way. We may not be the first generation of planets. The first generation could have been destroyed. Oh. Yeah, that's a neat idea. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, then I'll let, I'll let Jupiter stay <laughs> right there. So, I mean, I mean Jupiter, it, it's so many things. I mean, it's, a, it's such a beautiful, fascinating place by itself. You can see it in the night sky. I mean, you can actually see yeah. it looks like a little star to us, but that's actually the planet Jupiter. And then Galileo, you know, he invented the telescope about, you know, more than 400 years ago, and he saw it finally as a disk with moons around it. Uh, that actually helped him prove that the, uh, the, the Earth was not the center of the solar system, that there, the sun was the center. Yes. And one, one of the reasons he used was that things were orbiting around Jupiter as well. So not everything orbits around the Earth. But, uh, you know, it, it's a fascinating place by itself. It also has a whole story wrapped up in it as yeah. to how the solar system formed and how our own planet formed with it. And then it has this fascinating possibility as being a place for life. One of the moons of, of as I mentioned, Eu Europa. Yeah, I, I have that. Yeah, could have life on it today. So, I mean, that's, I mean, I would love to go to Europa, drill under the ice and find what? You know, shrimp, fish, maybe just bacteria. But Yeah, it, yeah, but it, something. It'd be wonderful mm -hmm. to know that life really exists somewhere else. Well, okay. Um, you mentioned Galileo. I know that you have a relationship with the Hubble. <laughs> Telescope. <laughs> oh yeah. I tell us about that. I'm fascinated. What what did you do? When when do you use it? What do you see? It just seems when I see it on television. Isn't it beautiful? Yeah, the pictures, right? Yeah. So I mean I'm, I'm so glad you talked about the gallery because I mean to me there are, there are many galleries at NASA. You know, there are ones yes. that are dedicated to Hubble. There are ones that are dedicated to our pictures of other planets yes. in our solar system. So there, there's so many wonderful ones to find. But the Hubble Space Telescope, um, uh, it, it is a telescope I have used professionally. Um, it was a while ago. I haven't done any research for a while now, but I, I did observe uh, some really interesting stars that were orbiting close enough to each other. They were ripping each other apart. And so you could actually sort of see what was happening when these two stars would orbit close to each other and the material would fly off from one to the other. And uh, that was one of the more interesting moments in my life because I remember being at a, uh, a ground-based telescope in Arizona, Kitt Peak, Mm -hmm. And I was waiting for uh, uh, two stars that I knew were going to orbit so close they would start to interact, start to rip bits off each other. And I was sort of counting down on my watch. I had the telescope all ready to, to observe this. It's like, okay, it's happening in 20 minutes, you know, five minutes, two minutes. And, and then, of course, you mentioned the word light year. Everything in space is so far away that, that after I was counting down on my watch, I asked myself, how long ago did this really happen, right? Because yeah. the light takes time to travel to us. Right. Now, light goes so fast. I mean, it, it goes 186,000 miles per second is the speed Say of light. Say that again. Yeah, 186,000 miles per second. But the, the distances in space are so big that in some cases it takes years or centuries yeah. or even millions or billions of years for that light to get to us. So a light year, just like you said, it's actually a unit of distance. Mm -hmm. the, it's the distance light travels in one year. Mm -hmm. So if you go 186,000 miles per second for a year, you cover about 6 trillion miles. And because we'd be writing zeros all day, yes. we, we call that one light year. Okay, And gotcha. so, you know, this, uh, you know this, this star that was about to rip itself apart, yeah, I mean, that only happened like 700 years ago. Right? See, that's, okay, <laughs> now that's the thing. Talking to children, okay, so you see that star? Yeah. It looks like it's far away, but it's old as yes. well. Yeah. And that's, uh, that the was light is old. You're seeing it in your eyes right now. You're seeing that star as it was hundreds of years ago. That's it. Say it again. Well, there's no way for light to get to us immediately. So when you look up in the sky, did you, do you have a favorite star? Any one you can think of? The Sirius or Betelgeuse? Or no, no, the, the no. The North Star? The North Star. You like the North Star? I yeah. do. The North Star provides information yeah, for, it does. You for can, lost people. You can put your bearings. That's right. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, I mean, when you look up, you know, in the, if, you look at, if you can find the North Star tonight, you know, you're seeing that star as it was hundreds of years ago. So you're, you're looking into the past. I mean, you can look at stars that were, you know, you, the, the light left 2,000 years ago or the light left a million years ago. 
Wow. <laughs> yes. The Andromeda Galaxy is the, 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 the closest galaxy. So this is a family of stars. Okay. And the Andromeda Galaxy you can actually see in the summer sky with a good pair of binoculars. Or on a, in a very dark sky, you can see it with your naked eye. And uh, that the light is 2 million years old. Okay, so when we're talking about galaxy, we're talking about a family. A family of stars that all orbit around together and all, all, all move through space together. And like I said, the one that we belong to is called the Milky Way. Yes. And th this is, it's amazing to think how big it is. So I was saying you could fit a million Earths inside the sun. So the sun's a huge thing. So how big is our star compared to our galaxy, our family of stars? Okay. And the, the best analogy I know is that if you can think about, I'm going to hold up a little page of text. If you can think about the dot of an eye. Okay. So you, you've got your release form here for me, and there's a dot of an eye. <laughs> you know, I, I hereby assign all, okay, here we go. So that, that little dot of an eye. Yeah. <laughs> if, if, if the sun were that size, so if, okay. you, if you could get a million Earths in that dot, then our galaxy would be as big as the Earth. Oh, wow. So the galaxy is really, really big. It's a collection of hundreds of billions of stars. And now get this. With the Hubble Space Telescope, we can see trillions of galaxies. So think about how big a one galaxy is. If this were the sun, if it had a million Earths inside a dot, okay. and, and the Earth would be our galaxy. Our galaxy. The Hubble Space Telescope can observe trillions of galaxies. What does that feel like? Ah, did you get shivers? I, I do. I still do. When I, when I see <laughs> the pictures, but I'm just imagining the size yes. and the the intelligence it took to build something that would allow that to give us this information. And I'm thinking... Uh, it's another wow. It, well, it's in some ways it's very simple. The Hubble Space Telescope is just a much larger, more sensitive eye, but it works very much like the human eye does. It's a light bucket; it just collects light. It's okay. just that we, we made a bigger one, and so we can see things that are much fainter and much farther away. But I mean, it, it's 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 sending ourselves out there, right? I mean, this we, we, you asked why do we do this? It always has to come back to answering questions about where we come from and who we are. Okay, so that is the seminal thought. <laughs> yes. Who we are and where we come from. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, it, it has changed every single part of my life. You know, it's changed. Talk the, about that a little bit well, It's changed more. the way I get up in the morning or how I brush my teeth or how I think about time and, and about, about losing loved ones and about, you know, about love. I mean, it, it's, it's changed everything about what it means for me to be a human it, because we are all connected on such a deep level. We are. Absolutely. And, and this is something that science gives me. I mean, again, the idea that science isn't about emotion or about love or about imagination. Um, you know, everybody told me that I didn't have the right sort of personality to be a scientist. It, that probably sounds no, familiar, put, put right? put a comma there. Oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> what? Sure. Because, you know, w w the way I experienced this it was from a child before I even yes, went, yes, I, I, before I ever went to a classroom. It was all about wonder and awe and yes, love yes, and yes, questions yes, yes. and curiosity. And they said, well, you're not, you're not logical. You know, you're, you're, you're too emotional. I mean, come on, you're female. I mean, there's, 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 <laughs> there a, it is. there's a lot of reasons you're not supposed to be a scientist. And, and, and the universe just doesn't care about that. The, the universe calls you. And the, the universe is yours. And there, there is not a single... I'm going to I'm gonna write that as a quote. <laughs> the universe yes. is yours. I mean, the wonderful thing about the universe is it doesn't care how famous you are or how beautiful you are or how young you are. You know, we are all every bit as much part of the universe as everybody else. We have this equally. I mean, it, it is an absolute leveler. And you know, that would be a nice message to get out. Well, I mean, think about it. I mean, so the story of the universe for me, you know, I think you mentioned you were looking at some of my videos. I don't know if you found, uh, I did a TED Talk called We Are All Dead Stars. Oh, yes, I, did. I have that right That's here in right. my notes. I want to know about that. Yes, yes. Well, I want you to tell. I actually watched the TED Talk. Right. So <laughs> you, can, you can share with our audience. Well, I mean, I mean, as we have used the Hubble Space Telescope and other, many other telescopes, I mean, mm -hmm. one of the amazing stories we found up there is we watched the stars actually creating all of the atoms that make up our body. So when I say atom, I mean a, a chemical, like mm -hmm. your bones are made of calcium, you know, and your uh, most of your body is made of carbon. You know, water uses hydrogen and oxygen. Those are all examples of, of chemical elements. And when we look very far out into space, remember I told you that we have to look very far back in time, yes, right? Yes, so, yes, yes. I mean, so if, if we look at things that are billions of light years away, so the light is actually billions of years old, Okay. we find out that the universe actually began very differently than it is today. Um, the only chemicals that we see out there, this is actually true. This is, the, this is not a theory. This is you take your telescope. You look at a galaxy very, very far away. And the only things you see are the lighter elements like hydrogen and helium. 
little bit of lithium, which we don't use very much, except uh, I guess lithium is good for depression treatment. Yes, like there but, you go. But um, those lighter elements are around, but nothing else. N none of the things that make up your body. The calcium, the carbon, the phosphorus, the sulfur, uh, the iron in your blood. You know, our blood is red because of iron in our blood. And what we watched is that as we, as we watched the whole story of the universe through the telescopes, the stars were the only things that made these other chemicals. So, so right now, your bones, like I said, calcium, iron, carbon, oxygen, everything other <laughs> than just hydrogen and helium, basically, was actually made inside a star. And then that star died and unraveled or blew up and distributed that material out into space. New stars and new planets formed out of that. And so, I mean, I am sitting in your studio right now, you know, uh, you know a, a conscious living consequence of stars having died. That's where all of my atoms came from, except the hydrogen, which was here from the beginning. But, you know, what story? And it's not just one star, right? I mean, as, as the galaxy turns around, you know, over billions of years, you know, many, many millions and billions of stars have died, and all of that material has gotten accumulated into us. So the stars are very much your close relatives, your brothers and sisters, your parents. I'm the, getting, you know, I'm writing quotes. Stars are your brothers absolutely. and sisters. Absolutely. You know, there, there was a star that died billions of years ago that created the iron in your blood that makes your blood red. And that same star probably, you know, distributed its atoms all around the galaxy. So when you point at a star in the sky, just pick any one, you know, pick a star, point at it, that star probably has a little bit of iron, you know, in it that was from the same explosion, the same star that died as the iron that's in your blood to make your blood red. I mean, there, there, there's, there, we're all connected. The entire universe is, 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 is just one thing. We're all together in it. I mean, so, so that's, when you learn that, nothing's ever the same. You know, when you look at another person, you know, all of a sudden they are this treasure that the universe took billions of years to come up with. There'll never be another you, right? Ever. 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 And um, most people don't understand that. I, I have, um, I mentor young people. And uh, I've had people say, oh, Miss Tyra, I want to be just like you when I grow up or when I grow old. And I say, no, 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 you don't. Because there's a you inside of you that is awesome. They can do something that no one else can do well. And so treasure that, you know, be that and appreciate that. And look in the mirror and see you. And, I, you know, there's just all kinds of possibilities looking in that mirror that are inside of you. So, uh, but sometimes that message is difficult because I have discovered, Michelle, there's some people that have not reached the point where they love themselves. So the, that kind of information bounces off, you know, and so sometimes they have to have a journey. You know, I can't just tell them that they are wonderful and they receive it. It takes some time. So, and that's, that's what I love to do is to connect with those people who feel broken and walk with them for a while. And uh, but I, I also want to know now, you, your job is to, your, no, 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 excuse me, <laughs> Michelle has already corrected me. My life. <laughs> your life, your passion is um, teaching and sharing the story. Um, what, what are your audience, audiences like? Well, you know, it's one of these things that I don't know why we don't write like children's books about this. I mean, it, it's a wonderful story. And for some reason, it hasn't gotten widely known, right? I mean, you, you, uh, you talk about, you know, for example, that the sun is like the, the stars. They're the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, I was really never taught that in school. I mean, we didn't really have astronomy. And so it, there's no judgment. I mean, I, I so often meet uh, really well-educated, intelligent people that have never heard that story, that the sun is like the stars. It's something that I, I really wish everybody knew. It gives you a sense of, of how connected we are. And then this, this larger story about how the stars made all of the stuff that makes your body. You know, you know, all of a sudden you have this incredible connection. You know, why doesn't everybody know this? It's not technical. It doesn't have to be something that we, you know, just use mathematics or physics or science to describe. You know, I, I don't know why we're not, you know, there, there aren't more songs about it or art made about it or poetry. You know, I think, I think, seriously, you're one of the few people I know that can make science sound logical to me 
And just because you know it does not mean you can communicate it. And to have enough people that can communicate it through songs, whatever. Yeah. Besides Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. Hey, it's a good start. Yeah. <laughs> because it starts with how I wonder what you are. That's right? true. And there's your word. Yeah, wonder. Just wonderment. follow the curiosity. That's all you really need. Follow the curiosity. And <clears throat> speaking of following, I need to take a very um, short break. Stay close. And we are back. We are having such a good time. I'm having an adventure. <laughs> I hope you are, too. We are out in space. We are learning about light years. We're learning about liquid planets. We're learning about spacecraft. We're just we're having a ball with Dr. Michelle. I saw call, Well, she said I can call her Ms. <laughs> and we're talking about not allowed to say her job. She calls what she does every day her life and her passion. And uh, she started out as a toddler looking up at the sky and filled with wonder. That just seemed to start her life. And then there was space camp. You know what? I, I did hear somebody say that you were a debater and that uh, space camp and debate teams contributed to your leadership. Is that true? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, people often are really surprised when they say, you know, what's the most useful thing you did in high school to become a scientist? And, mm -hmm. and they, they're thinking, oh, well, I took lots of math. And I did. I mean, I, I, I did that, too. But um, the debate club was a chance to, to, to really learn how to formulate a good argument, but also present it, right? That the idea that in debate you have to get up and you have to talk. Mm -hmm. You have to actually explain your point to somebody. Um, you know, n science is not something that's done by yourself. You have to work in teams. You have to convince people that your ideas are good ideas. Uh, you know, eventually you have to write proposals and say, well, I'd like to use the Hubble Space Telescope. Well, it turns out lots of people would like to use the <laughs> Hubble Space Telescope. So you have to write a very convincing argument as to why you should be the one that gets to use it. So, you know, writing, uh, you know, reasoning, be being able to put together a really good argument. And I, and I don't mean debate in term, necessarily in terms of being an adversary. It's not that you have to argue and, and someone has to win and someone has to lose. It, it, it's all about presenting your ideas and finding the best ideas. So, you know, I think that th that aspect of debate, I, I really, really liked. Um, I, I, I didn't particularly like the competitive nature. I, I, I mm -hmm. like to be more collaborative. But, you know, even in a collaborative environment, someone's going to say to you, well, so what's your idea? You know, tell us exactly. about it. Exactly, exactly. And, and to be ready to present and, and, and with a smile and say, hey, you know, the, the confidence. And um, honestly, the confidence for me was largely uh, uh, fate. <laughs> you know, I, uh, I, you, you were talking a bit about... Um, you know, your journey of self-love, right, about how this is something that's really important. And I think this is, you know, this is one of my, aside from the astronomy and the wonder of it all and all the great facts that I know about space, I think that the thing that I really try to get across in my work is this idea of the journey of self-love. Okay. That, uh, you know, I, um, at first, you know, science can be taught in this rather confrontational way. Mm -hmm. That when you get to university, I mean, they don't really mean to be mean, but the, the idea is I challenge you to learn this, right? Are you smart enough? to actually pass your, your physics class. You know, some of you are going to pass and some of you aren't. And um, there is absolutely no reason why science has to be taught that way. If, if, you, if you wish to learn science, mm -hmm. you can learn it. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm sorry, everybody out there who's listening right now is smart enough. Right? That, that, that's not a question. Um, I mean, by, by any definition in terms of, I mean, I, I, I almost failed several of my college science classes. It was not easy for me. And I would have to sort of psych myself up into a character mm -hmm. that I, I, I mean, I literally remember standing outside, you know, classrooms and saying, the character you're going to assume is somebody who is good at science, who's confident, you know, who's going to, you know, succeed at this. And it's not how I felt. And, you know, I, I know that, you know, the theme, your theme for this month was, was be bold, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And, you know, the, the, the thing that for me, it, it, it turns out that, that I, I never, I never really felt bold. <laughs> I, you just played that role. I played that role, and it turns out that that's okay. That you know, you, you can be as bold and as fabulous as you're ever going to be without changing. I never felt I wanted to be that confident, sophisticated, worldly person that was, you know, you know, really in control of everything and you know was a success. And 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 now, it, further on in life, I, I am a success by many people's definition, but I still don't feel that way. Okay, see. 
Now, this is what I want to get to for our listening audiences. There are brilliant people out there doing brilliant things. I don't call it a mask. I'm saying they do, they be, they become who they have to be to stay in that place called passion and contribute and advance life as we know it. So, if you do that long enough, eventually you will believe it. You will have it. There's a power associated with habit. And I'm looking, I'm looking at the clock, and I'm thinking, oh, Michelle, could you come back at some <laughs> point? <laughs> well, absolutely. I mean, because I'd like to tell you about, you know, people that think scientists are confident or that, or that, yeah. you know, they, they feel a certain way. You know, I've had to deal with feeling like I'm an imposter, like I don't belong, uh, feeling like a failure. I, I've, I've really had to walk through failure a lot. And so, you know, I mean, one of the big things for me is that the universe does tell you you are you are a special gift yeah. just as you are yeah 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 and i I'm, I'm, i've given up ever you know whatever thinking i'm going to get up in the morning and feel like i've always hoped i should feel <laughs> you're you're already enough and i'm 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 using that i'm going to use that for a theme and then you can come back and we can do that <laughs> okay now uh michelle does not escape everyone else's uh opportunity to share a letter uh that she might have written to her younger <laughs> self. I did. I totally did. I just forgot to bring it. <laughs> but she guarantees me that she can tell you what's in that letter. So I'm excited, and uh, I can't wait to hear it, dear. You ready? Yeah, I remember how I began it, actually. Okay. So what I would say to my young self is relax. Y you are striving much, much too hard. You are worried about everything, and you feel like if you stop worrying, everything will fall apart. Somehow the fear, somehow the worry makes it seem like you have some control over what's going to happen in your life. So many times you were flying white knuckled through thunderstorms. I'm afraid of flying. And I fly all the time. So many times you were in bad relationships thinking you could never get out. So many times you failed tests. You were lonely. And it would be nice to say, you know, now I'm, I'm 48 years old, you know, at least up until this time, Nothing all that terrible happened. You, know, you, you did lose loved ones. You did get your heart broken. You were cheated. You know, there were bad things that happened. But you, I wish I could make you relax more. I, I wish you didn't have to spend your life so present in fear. Because the fear in the end didn't do anything. It didn't help. You didn't get control over anything. But the thing that you should really be proud of is that as much as you were afraid, the fear never held you back. And, and this is something that I really want to pat you on the back for. You got on those airplanes, even though you were terrified. You, you, you got married. You took out mortgages. You did things that were risky. And nothing terrible happened. Everything never fell apart. Maybe something fell apart, but not everything. And the times in my life that I've been most proud are times when I walked through that fear. I did things afraid. And you never felt as fearless and sophisticated and worldly as you wanted to. But that's okay. You already had that in you. You know, it turns out you were never any good at being anything other than yourself. And, and while that's disappointing, there were good things too. You could never take revenge on anyone. You could never cheat anyone. You tried to cheat on tests, but you were never any good at it. <laughs> you, you were never any good at lying. All of the times you, you even tried to do something wrong, you just were bad at that. You, 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 you always came back to yourself. And in the end, you were kind. And even though you were scared, you tried to help others with the fear first. So I would just say, please, please relax. Don't strive so hard. Don't try to change everything about you. Just believe that you were enough from the very beginning. Oh, Michelle, that's lovely. And I loved your authenticity and your vulnerability. Uh, that makes you less a scientist <laughs> to the universe. This is what I'm trying to change. Scientists <laughs> are totally vulnerable. <laughs> yeah, seriously. But um, if I can add just a little bit to what you said, this is our take with for the rest of the week when you're, you're tired and feeling not enough. Your calling in life is to fully express who you already are. The world will never see another human being just like you. 
There is no one on the face of the planet that has what you have. Your uniqueness in every respect is your gift. Life asks one thing of you, to be the full expression of yourself so that you can have your unique imprint on all those you encounter in the world. Never underestimate the power of your energy and how it ripples outwards to affect everything and everyone around you if you are being your full, authentic self. I want you to remember, you're not alone. You're not your circumstances. Let me repeat, you have everything inside of you you need. You're listening to Radio Fairfax. My guest has been Dr. Michelle Thaller. This is Frankly Speaking with Tyra G. I love you. Bye now.